Hello, welcome to the Operations Management Suite Expedition Series Session 2. I'll be your host today, Gabriel Taylor. We're going to be going through log analytics, talking about how we can analyze performance data using log search. So diving right in. First off, I just want to do a quick summary of what the OMS Expedition Series is and introduce this session, followed by just diving straight in. There's not going to be a whole lot of slides. Most of this is live demo, so we'll just dive right through it. For those who haven't seen our previous videos, the OMS Expedition Series is a series that we're doing here at Model Technology, showing off the benefits that Operations Management Suite tools can bring to your data centers today. Uh, a lot of people we've interacted with have this idea that because OMS is a cloud platform using cloud tools, that it does not have any place or does not really work with traditional on-prem data centers or hybrid data centers, and that's uh, very much not true. There's a whole lot of benefits that can be brought to your existing data center with leveraging the OMS technologies. What we want to do in this series is talk about that and demonstrate the sorts of things we can get out of OMS today from our on-prem data centers. So in this session, we're going to be talking about log analytics using this as an opportunity to dive through how to use log analytics log search, how to search for data, how to present data. And we're going to be doing that with this scenario of looking at performance data on our servers. For those of you who aren't aware, Operations Management Suite is a suite of tools from Microsoft that is a centralized management and monitoring platform. It has several key areas of functionality broken up into four main quadrants, insight and analytics, security and compliance, protection, recovery, and automation and control. These are served by a collection of tools based around Azure, including Log Analytics, Azure Automation, Azure Backup, and Azure Site Recovery. We're going to be going primarily through Log Analytics today, which in terms of these quadrants covers mainly the Insight and Analytics and Security and Compliance components of the suite through its many solutions and many capabilities. We're going to focus today specifically on the log search and performance data. So the first thing we want to do is enable performance data collection in our log analytics workspace. In our workspace, it's assumed that we already have a workspace set up, as well as agents reporting to that workspace providing, performance, uh, providing data. We're going to talk about how to enable performance data. So as far as what data can be collected, Windows and Linux, any performance data that, uh, that's on those servers, performance counters, can be collected and viewed in Operation Management Suite Log Analytics. It's really easy to enable. When we do it, the configuration is applied to all of the agents we have being monitored. We have the ability to specify how frequently the data should be collected down from 10 seconds up to a maximum of 30 minutes. Uh, now, this is the interval between which time data is collected. So if we set it for 10 seconds, we're going to be getting a new picture, a new record created of what that counter was like every 10 seconds. That's going to give us the capability to have a lot more insight and analytics into what's happening on our server performance-wise. It also means that we're pulling in a lot more data to Azure. Depending on what licensing model you're using, that may be something you want to be aware of. If you're using the OMS licensing model, which is unlimited data, then who cares? Collect it all because it'll give you the more most to work with. But if you're not using that, if you're doing a pay per, per usage model, then you will want to find the right balance between how much data you want to collect and how much data you actually want to be able to work with, what level of insight you want to get into that. So with regard to performance data, when you enable performance counters, again, whether it's Windows or Linux, this is the summary of the data that LMS is going to collect that we're going to be able to work with. So these are the properties that will be available in every record. We're going to have the computer being the, the actual computer that that data came from, the name of the performance counter, the path of the counter, be it whack whack computer name, whack uh, object, whack counter instance, whack counter name. Uh, have the counter value, which is of course what that value is. If we're looking at CPU utilization, that's going to be our 15% or 99% or whatever that value is at that time of sampling. Instance name is going to be the name of the instance being collected. For performance counters that do not have instances, then it's just going to be empty. But for any others, it'll be your C drive or processor or total, etc. Object name is the name of the performance object from which that counter is connected. 
Source system designates the type of agent which data is collected. This means it's going to show us whether it came from a Windows system or a Linux system, or if the data is piping up through uh, Operations Manager on-prem, we'll see Operations Manager in there. If we're pulling data from Azure, et cetera, we'll see that source listed in the source system field. And time generated is simply a timestamp of when that data was sampled. So let's quickly dive into the portal itself and look at enabling this and what it looks like in the portal. So let's hop over to my log analytics bit. Here, as we've already seen in previous videos, is the main page of log analytics in the operation management suite. Each of the solutions I have enabled and views I've designed show up here as a separate tile. We've got quick access to various functions for enabling performance data collection. If, uh, if we just want to select a counter and go, we want to go into our settings first off. That's the big gear icon down here. Once we go into the settings, we'll go to this data tab. And we can see the number of different types of data we can enable in here. Right now, we're focusing on performance counters. So I'm going to click into the window of performance counters view. Now, inside here, we can see I already have a whole lot of performance data being collected in my workspace. Uh, logical disk data, memory data, network adapter, CPU, and more. And we can see that for each of these right now, I've got them all being sampled at a 10 second interval. This setting is per counter. So if I wanted to only collect percent free space once an hour, I could come in here and set this to 3,600 seconds. Oh, actually the max is 1,800. So I think I mentioned that in a previous slide. So let's set to 1,800 and we'll get one sample every, eight, every half hour. Or for my purposes, I'm gonna leave it at 10 and get all the data. If I wanna add a new counter, we can come in here to start typing, and it'll give us recommendations from uh, common counters. If your counter that you're wanting to add is not a common counter, say it's application specific, something that is not built into Windows or not based off of any common applications, you just type it in the same format, be it the object, instance, counter name. For right now, I'm just going to type in process, and we can see a number of recommended counters pop up with the name process in it. There's actually a whole lot here. I don't know if this is what I want or not, but I'm gonna actually go to the Hyper-V one. So let me just cite, filter this down to the hypervisor root partition. And I'm gonna select of these my, well, just for example, total messages per second. Once I add that in there, hit the plus sign, it gets added. Now to commit that change, I would need to hit save here. Similarly, if I want to remove things, nothing is saved until I hit save. If I hit discard, everything pops back to where it was when we first came in here. If we've got a whole lot we want to add, we can just add them one at a time. Actually, there's a whole lot we want to add. You can actually add these via PowerShell. So you can write out in PowerShell what counters you want. Type that in via the uh, Log Analytics PowerShell module and populate those very quickly. If you're doing one at a time, we can easily come in here. If you're not sure what format to put it in, you can always hover over this. It gives you a bit of an idea. Um, if you want a specific counter, a specific instance rather, you can put that instance in. Otherwise, drop a wildcard in and it'll collect all instances of that counter. Great example of that. Down here under the processor, you'll see that I'm collecting processor total percent processor time, not the asterisks. If I were collecting, collecting the asterisks, you'd see that I'd have data for processor 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, each of the individual cores, whereas total is going to give me the overall summary for a given computer. Once we have that configured, we hit save, and bam, that configuration is going to be distributed to our agents, and we'll start seeing data come in within a few minutes. Now, this is near real-time performance counters, performance visualization in log analytics. So the actual amount of time it takes between when that sample is taken and when that sample is visible online is very short. It's less than 36, I think it's around 10 seconds, actually. Um, there's always going to be a slight, slight, slight delay, a matter of seconds, but you can almost see, you can see via the portal here, almost precisely what that value is at the time that you use it. So while that's starting to pull in some data, I'm going to head back over to the slideshow. And we'll go in a little bit more. So we're going to talk about how we actually use that data once it's there in log search. So Right in, to get to log search, you just click that log search button in the upper corner of the log analytics workspace. 
Uh, if you're doing this inside the Azure portal, you can also access the log search there. I'm currently living in the, the full OMS portal. That's where we'll be seeing inside the demo. When you click that log search button, it is going to pull up the main log search screen. Now, Microsoft has done a really good job here presenting a lot of information off the bat to guide you to what you want to see. It doesn't just give you a search bar and tell you to go. It actually gives you a recommendation on how to create a query. It gives you a recommended query here. This query that you see on my picture here is showing IIS logs, but the actual query that shows up and the way it breaks it down is done uh, of a random set. Each time you load that page, you're going to see a different query there, giving you an idea on how to structure that. There's also a number of built-in queries that it recommends, giving you quick access to look at data, links to the documentation, and recommendations on how to do things. And we also have a whole lot of saved searches. I mentioned in a previous video that each of the solutions that come in Log Analytics, when enabled, they deploy a whole slew of saved searches. You can use these right off the bat to quickly find information and quickly visualize information in Log Search. You can also save your own queries. So if we go through and we build a query that we like a lot and we want to be able to pull that back up later, we can save that and not have to rewrite it every time. So from there, once we dive in, the first thing we want to do is put in what type of data we're searching for. You can start with a default query. You can just type in asterisks and pull up every record you have. And what's going to happen is when you see those records, Log Analytics is also going to show you a bar on the left-hand side that gives you some common filters to start with to filter that data. We're going to have a time range up in the upper left-hand corner that we can use to filter what time range you want to look at. This sets the global scope of what data we're visualizing when we query data, what time range. We're also going to see the most common properties to use down here, along with a summary of how many records are going to be visible if we filter by that. So right now in this image, I just have type-perf in there, type-perf. So this is the line that we're only looking at performance data. And we can see that there are a number of objects that that it's recommending for us to filter on further. We see the, the largest ones up top. We can click the More button to see more of those. It's important to note the properties are really just tags. There's no relational database behind this. Rather, each record is a record as a blob of key value pairs, with the key being the tag, the property, and the value being what the property is, what the value is for that property on that record. What this does is it makes it really easy to navigate through. We don't have to worry about a detailed class structure or relationships or anything. We just say, I want to see all records that are type perf or type perf or type event or et cetera, et cetera. We can build that query and not have to worry about uh, the back end because all the filtering, all the structuring happens on the fly in our query. So I mentioned that it recommends a list of properties on the side. We also, if the one property you're, you're looking for is not there, and you know it exists, you can't recall how it's spelled or something like that, there's an Add button down here. We can click and pull up the full list of filters, which we see a little bit of over here on the side. We'll see more of that in the demo here in a few minutes. As we pick our properties and add them to the filter, we're able to start building out our query. And if we want, we can also just type it out. Uh, one of the benefits to Log Analytics being a text query based system is that any query that you have is going to work. But the question is only whether or not the data is there on the back end. If you're out on the internet going through community sites and you find somebody's site that said, hey, here is this query to visualize logical disk free space in the best way, the best ever. Just use this query. And you want to try it out, don't have to worry about doing crazy imports or building wizards or monitors or whatnot. So long as the data is there, as long as you've enabled that data collection, all you have to do is copy that query, paste it into your log search window, and go. It's very simple. When we're typing this out, there's a few things to keep in mind. We are able to wrap quotes around literal strings to denote what we are uh, searching for. If our string has um, a space in it, you have to write wrap quotes about around it. You actually see in the image here that I've got a search for current disk queue length uh, performance counters. 
And because that counter has spaces in it, I've got to wrap that in quotes, otherwise it's not going to work. Uh, whereas over here with logical disk, because it's just one word, no spaces, I have no quotes around that. Now, if we're not putting it inside quotes, we can use wildcards. However, since anything inside quotes is viewed as a literal string, so it doesn't expand wildcards when they're inside quotes. Important to know. Additionally, lots of things here are case sensitive. Property tags, case sensitive. If you type in counter name, lowercase, it's not going to work. You're going to get a smiley face. Whereas if you type in counter name with a capital C and N, like is over here, it's going to pull up the data. Same for some of the strings. A lot of times you put in a server name. If your servers are named the combination of uppercase and lowercase, you might need to wrap an or statement around that so that it looks for the lowercase version or the uppercase version. Or just released general availability earlier this week, and I don't have it inside my demo here. You also can use regular expressions now. So you could type in a regular expression that says DC case insensitive in order to pull that up. When we're typing these, we can use either an equal sign or a colon to tag the value to the property tag. There's also other characters we're going to use. You're going to see that in just a moment. But the core way is equals. You can use a colon or an equals. Both mean the same thing. There's also other filters you can do. I mentioned doing an or around both uppercase and lowercase. You can use and statements and or statements. You can wrap statements in parentheses to make sure that the order of operations is analyzing that statement appropriately. We can use Boolean operators with the appropriate data types to say greater than, greater than or equal, less than, less than, equal, etc. If you're just comparing strings, equal and not equal are the ones that are going to work there. But if you're comparing times or integer values or anything like that, you can use any of those other Boolean values. You can also use the word now as a keyword to quickly reference the current time. So if we wanted to see records that were generated in the last six hours, we wouldn't have to worry about figuring out what the six hours ago time was and what uh, uh, how to state that in the query. All I have to do is say time generated greater than nine min or now minus six hours, and we're going to see those records from the last six hours. You can also query a range. If whatever value you're doing is numeric based, you can query that range to get everything in there. For example, for, pardon me, for example, a great example is doing event IDs. If we wanted to capture all event IDs in a given range, we could wrap that in uh, block quotes, put a pair of periods in between them, and pull up all those records. Note that if you are querying a range, you do have to use the colon, not the equal sign for that. It's a slight difference, but that's really the only time you ever have to use colon versus equal, the only time you have to think about it. So once we build our query, and we pull up our performance data, or whatever other data we're visualizing, we can actually view that in a variety of ways. By default, we're going to pull up data, and it's going to show that data in a list form, just showing us the list of records. That's what we see in one of the past slides right here. This is just a list of records that are being pulled up. We've got a timestamp, we've got the data type, uh, and we've got the values. But we also have the ability to view it as a table or view it as metrics. Table is just going to give you the same information in a table format. Metrics is going to, depending on the type of data, give you some better visualization. So with performance data, we can click over to metrics, and it's going to summarize all those records into a visualized graph of that time of that counters value. We can see here in this image that I've got two servers showing right here, uh, Delamend OM16 and AZDC01, both looking at processor total percent processor time based on my query up here. And it's going to show by default this little graph for each of them, showing the performance over the last time, showing all the records. We can also click that plus button to expand that and see what we have here with a greater idea of what these times are, when those spikes are at, better view of what those what the range is, also a summary of what the average is over this time period and what the last record received value was. So that's very quick, very easy to see. And what's cool about this is that again, this is near real time. So as we sit here, we can refresh this and pull up new data as it pipes in. Once we have pulled up the records of the information we want to see, the next step then is to analyze that data and present it in different ways. 
Right here with metrics, we've got a basic way of doing that, just showing the records as they are. But there's a lot more we can do with that. Log Analytics really does give us a lot of power in the search language to analyze and process data in a variety of ways. So we can pipe that, data, that query result data into a subsequent statement or multiple subsequent statements to keep shifting and framing that data. So for example, here, this is the query from that last image, type, perf, object name, et cetera, et cetera. However, we are piping that to measure count by computer. In this case, what we'll see instead of a list of the records, we'll actually see a table showing us what the computers are and how many records, how many performance records we have being that criteria for, the, that, uh, for each computer. That's just one of many ways of doing it. There's a number of keywords we can use. A, number, a couple of them listed here is a whole lot more that I don't have listed here. Uh, these are kind of the big ones that we use most frequently, measuring averages and count and percentile, min, max. Um, however, I definitely, if you want to dive into this in detail, you should definitely refer to the documentation. I've got a link there. I'm also going to drop that link in the description of this video. That's going to give us a lot more information because you're going to see all of the different options. So now we're going to dive in and actually walk through this. Much more fun than a bunch of slides. So here in Log Search, once again, we're going to kick it off by clicking that log search button. And right away, we can see that I've gotten a different query showing up here than was in that image. If I refresh this, another query should show up all together as well. Hopefully that comes back up quickly. Huh. Yeah, so here's an even more involved query popping up, showing us that it's pulling up, hey, type perf, counter name percent processor time, and piping that over to a um, average measurement and an aggregation, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So you can see that if you just sit here and hit refresh, you can get a lot of information about how this query language works without having to do much work. Again, we've got links here to the documentation as well as a number of built-in query recommendations. And if we click favorites up here in the corner, we're going to see all these saved searches that we've made or that solutions have published. There's a whole lot in here. We can click and expand these out. There's a lot. How do we search them? Just type in here. We want to type, just type in perf, we can see all the perf ones, hit percent, see all the percentage ones, etc. You can see I've got a whole lot of demo queries ready to go for this. Otherwise, we can just start typing. If we hit asterisk, that's going to pull up every record in our database for the given time range. Right now, I've got my data filtered set to the last day. If I wanted, I could set this out to down to six hours at seven days, or at a custom range, specifying the date and time I want to see. So if I want to see sometime in the past, I can use this to pull up that window. For right now, for ease of use, I'm going to leave it a day. When we look at the time bar here, we also have the ability to filter within that. and It'll adjust to a custom range. So if we wanted to just cut this down some, we can do that. It's going to reduce the custom time range. We'll pull up a few different records. We also trim off the other end. I'm going to set it back to a day. Note that right now we're pulling up 6 million results super fast. This is one of the benefits of Log Analytics versus an on-prem solution is that Log Analytics is sitting in the Azure cloud. It has all the power of the cloud behind it, enabling it to do a lot of very fast processing on the data, allowing it to give you that data really fast. It, to replicate this on-prem, we would need the database system to be very robust, very high resource uh, capabilities, very fast I.O., and that's expensive. Um, by putting it in the cloud, we're able to save a lot of money on resources. So I mentioned before, we can hit asterisks, see all the records in here. We also see a whole lot of recent queries. I'm going to click away from that. And that's going to give us some recommendations on the side. Right now, because we don't have any filter, we're just doing an asterisk, it doesn't have much to go on, so it's just saying, hey, choose a type of record. We can come in here and we can choose one or more than one, or we can just click on one to add that in. Click type perf and add that in there. And just to clean things up a little bit and take the asterisks out, but that's totally unnecessary. So now we're seeing all the performance data in my log analytics workspace in the last day. Four million results in the last day. It's a lot of data to go through. Let's try and filter that down some. Let's say we want to look at logical disk performance data. I'll click right there, add that right into my query. 
maybe I want to filter this down to disk reads per second. I'll just, or three megabytes, click that, add that in. Note that right now I'm building a query and I'm reducing, I'm, I'm narrowing down the field of what data I'm pulling, but I haven't typed a character yet. I've just been clicking through aside from the asterisk. This is one of the benefits of this query builder is that if you just want to explore or if you're just building a basic query, you don't have to fully understand a log search language. You just need to go in and start clicking. Um, if we're looking at these recommendations aside, it's going to show us the most used values within the given query that we have and how many records are likely to come up for that. If we want to filter on a different query, again, we click add right here. And it's going to give us a whole lot of filters. This is going to give us access to every property in there. We can type in just some random characters and it'll filter down and we can see what we might want to add. Now, not all of these are going to have relevant data. Since we're looking at type perf right now, I mentioned before in the presentation that there's only those seven or eight properties that are brought through by perf data. We could add failure reason, event ID, et cetera, and that wouldn't be useful because there's just no values for that for the query we have. But if we didn't have the type perf in there, we might have that for other data. Every parameter we see, every property we see in here exists because it exists on some record somewhere. So I'm going to close this part out and back over here. As we look at this, we can see that we are seeing the first couple parameters for this record. This is organized by the most recent record, the oldest record, by the way. Click Show More to see what other records are being pulled in, or the properties are being pulled in, rather. Again, we click over to Table and see that data in a table form, or click to Metrics and start to visualize that data. Click through. We can click on these things as well to add filters to our query. So if I wanted to, say, add in a counter name, we already have that up there. So that's not really changing anything. Uh, if I were to say instance name, click on instance name, that's going to give us a little bit of a filter. Note that it's still searching. If I add in the L, that's just going to filter on L. Note it's going to filter on that L drive in whatever field it's in. I didn't tag it with anything. So we're seeing now all the L drive records. But if this was something else, just an L, we're not going to see anything because it's looking for little. We're going to see everything with an L in it. Lots of data. So as we drill through this, we can start exploring and playing with more things. I'm going to pull up some of my uh, demo queries here to show this off. Percent processor time, I mentioned this already. We can filter our metrics and see what that record is for each computer. But what if we want to see more data overlay? We want to see how much data is being collected per computer. Note that I added in this query here. It's same query as before, just with measure count by computer on there. And we're seeing how many records are available. If we want to play with that further, let's say we want to add in a certain computer name. We can come back and I'm going to say computer equals. And note that as I start, it's going to give me some recommendations. This is very smart. It'll autofill based off what we do. If you put in, start typing a certain area, it's going to recognize, hey, we're looking for a new parameter. It's going to give us recommendations on what those parameters could be. It's going to give us recommended values. We can come through. I'm just going to filter it down to this one computer, just for example. Click on the button, pull up the data, and now I'm looking at data for just that one computer. And I didn't have to type the name, I just clicked it, it recommended it, made it nice and easy. If I wanted to see any server that had a DC in it though, click on this one right here. It's the same thing, only for computer I have asterisk DC asterisk. So that's just making sure that any computer with lowercase DC in it is getting pulled in. I mentioned before, if we have a combination of uppercase and lowercase, we might have to do an OR statement. So the way I would do that, drop a pair of parentheses around, around here is to make sure it uh, analyzes it separately. I was going to put OR computer equals asterisk DC asterisk, and it'll pull through any of the capital DC in it. Now, in my environment, I don't actually have any capital DCs. So that's not a great example, but I'll put a CM in here. And we'll see not only are we getting our DC, our DC, we're also getting our CM server. So we can add more data in that way. 
We can do a lot more with this as well. I mentioned before that we can use the time generated now keyword to filter by a certain time range. So I've added in with this query the same base query, but added in this time generated now minus three hours. What that's doing is pulling up just the data from the last three hours. Because over here we have this filtered to one day and we have this filtered to three hours, we're only seeing this chunk here because it's trying to present the whole thing based off that uh, time range. But we can use this and then do other data with it. So if I wanted to measure, I can see how many, many records have come in in the last three hours. Or if I want to see what the average value has been over the last three hours, I can change that to a measure average with the counter value being the property that's being averaged, sort it by computer, and we can see what that average has been. So I can see that in the last three hours, my config man server here has had the highest average CPU usage. If we wanted to change this to some other time range, make it last one hour, it's as simple as plugging in the other number and letting it go. Now I put in now minus 24 hours, 24 is a full day, so we're looking at this full time range. But something important to note, if I were to change this to 48 hours, right? That's the last two days. Those numbers aren't changing too much. And the reason is we're still looking to last 24 hours based off this filter right here. If I were to change this to last seven days, we could fully reach the last seven days worth of data. Now our query will be restricted to the last two days. Whatever time range of data you find in the query is going to be filtered by two things. One being the time range set in the side here, as well as the other being whatever time range you set in the query. So picture is a Venn diagram with time range set in the, uh, the global scope on the left, time range set in the query scope on the right, and only that bit in the overlap where those time ranges overlap is what's visible. So that's something to think about when you're designing your queries. If you're not seeing data you're expecting, make sure that your global scope, your global time range here covers that. So some other cool things we can do with this performance data. It's not just measuring average or whatnot, but you can also aggregate that data on the fly. So if I wanted, let me just pull up one of these here. We got, this is the same data, same query we've been looking at percent processor time, type perf, et cetera. Measure average counter value, is that what we were just at? Although we're presenting it in this interval one hour. What that does is it aggregates the data on the fly. We don't have to worry about aggregate data being stored in the back end. In the back end, all the data is individually stored. We can have the ability to perform our own aggregation by whatever metric we want, whatever time range we want, when we're running the query. So here I've done a one hour aggregation. If we wanted to see the same data in, say, 30 minutes, I can just click in here, type in 30 minutes, and note the chart's going to change a little bit, but it's roughly the same because it's the same data. We're just aggregating it at a at twice as frequently, at a 30-minute interval instead of a uh, one-hour interval. Same thing, we can pull that down to a five-minute interval, see even more data. Or if we want to change it down to a single minute. Now, since we're doing 10 second collection, this is going to be six records aggregated per. Note that this is breaching the point of usefulness, but we can always change that back out again. Note how fast I'm doing this as well. Again, doing this on prem, much more expensive, not just in terms of uh, computational resources, but in terms of hardware resources. By leveraging the cloud for this, we're able to leverage log analytics. We're going to use log analytics to visualize this data however we want very quickly. We can also present this data in different ways. So right now, looking at a line chart, switch over to a bar chart. We can switch around the y-axis to some other form, make it a log logarithmic minimum. We can set minimum values. We can really control how we visualize this data. Change this back over to a line chart. We can also come down here and selectively hide, unhide items, so we can drill down and see just what that one is. If we want, we can go click on that and drill straight to those records and perform more processing. 
Um, other things we can do, here's a very similar uh, query, but instead of doing the average value, we're doing the 70th percentile value. And for those of you who have statistics backgrounds, what that basically does is it looks at the 70% the range of consistency, the top 20, 30% is being cut off to remove the outliers and look at what are functional averages over time, removing the skews. So 70th here might be a bit more aggressive than you want. Maybe you just want to cut off the highest peaks. You want to set this to 95. So we can get that. Again, I type two characters and bam, I have that data. There's no need to run a giant report or configure objects or any crazy stuff like you may have to do other systems. The data is just here. We just need to write a string to analyze that. We can also overlay data on top of each other. So we can pull up this one here. And as I break into the query as it loads, we'll see that I actually have several measure actions happening. It's not just just measure min or just measure max. We've got a min calculation, an average calculation, a percentile 75 calculation, and a max calculation all in a one hour aggregate. So we're seeing a whole lot of data overlaid here. And you might be thinking, great, a bunch of lines. What's the usefulness of this? Well, the usefulness is what you can do. Um, I'm going to filter this down to just a single computer. Actually, I'm going to leave that query as is and just come down here and select none on all of these. And I'll just select a single computer to go back into it. So now we're looking at is the values for that computer across multiple calculations. We can see that the average, the, if we look down here, average is the orange. So this orange line here, that's the average percent processor time over the past day that we've had in here, aggregated as an hour. But we can see that the min value and max value have pretty good uh, range to them. It has gotten up high and has been pretty low. But that average itself is less than 20, not worth worrying about, save the spike here. We can also see that blue line, which corresponds to the percentile 75, which is, again, removing out the, the, the big skews and showing us just that amount. It's actually pretty close to average. What that tells us is that the uh, jumps while high aren't that big a deal. It's not skewing it far from the average. We're looking at pretty good data here. So if we change that to a slightly lower aggregation. Again, just select the one computer. And we could select just that computer in the query. I'm just doing this for ease. We can see a bit more detail on that data. We can also come in here and select the time range and zoom into that. Give us the ability to really drill in and check out that information. So that's some really fun things we can do here in Log Analytics as we work with Log Search. Um, if you build a query and you like it, you can go to Save. All you have to do is type in a name and put in a category. It's free form. You can put in whatever you want. I'm going to reselect my demo queries category. It should pop up here in a second. Well, maybe I already have that one in there. Um, normally, it's always in a demo, isn't it? Change the query sum and see if that changes anything. Okay, normally it pops up with the name of potential uh, categories here. Right now, it's not. I'm not really sure why. But uh, just type in the category you want to put it in. You can make a new one if you want. Hit save, and that's going to get available inside your favorites list. So I'll go back to favorites, go back down to my demo query section, and there's that test query just saved. When you get rid of it, hit that X, delete the query. So that is using log search to visualize performance data in a nutshell. Some more advanced things we can do that we're going to talk about in later sessions would be building alerts off of queries to take action or to give notifications, as well as saving those queries, using those queries as part of custom visualizations so we can get data like this uh, view right here, 
where we have a number of tabs showing with a lot of performance data or other data all presented that behind the scenes is just queries that we've configured to be presented in these ways. So this is stuff we're going to talk about in more detail in future sessions. Um, in summary, in this video, we've gone through how to enable log collection and log, or data collection of performance data in log analytics. We've talked about how to query data, how to use the query builder, and how to analyze that data. Um, I thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments, shoot us an email. We're glad to hear from you. Thank you very much and have a good day.